Danny, Champion of the World by Roald Dahl Adapted by Edward Kelsey My father, without the slightest doubt, was the most marvellous and exciting father any boy ever had. When I was four months old, my father was left to look after me all by himself. I had no brothers and sisters, so all through my boyhood there were just the two of us, my father and me. We lived in an old gypsy caravan behind a filling station. My father owned the filling station and the caravan and a small field behind. It was a very small filling station on a small country road surrounded by fields and woody hills. When I was still a baby, my father washed me and fed me and changed my nappies and did all the millions of other things a mother normally does for her child. That is not an easy task for a man especially when he has to earn his living at the same time by repairing motor car engines and serving customers with petrol. The filling station itself had only two pumps. There was a wooden shed behind the pumps that served as an office and the square brick building to the right of the office was the workshop. My father built that himself and it was the only really solid thing in the place. As he used to say to me, we are engineers, you and I, Danny. We earn our living by repairing engines, and we can't do good work in a rotten workshop. This is big enough to take one car comfortably and leave plenty of room round the sides for working. And it has a telephone, so the customers can arrange to bring their cars in for repair. The caravan was our house and our home. It was a real old gypsy wagon with big wheels and fine patterns painted all over it in yellow and blue. My father said it was at least 150 years old, and with a horse to pull it, it must have wandered for thousands of miles along the roads and lanes of England. But now, its wanderings were over, and because the wooden wheels were beginning to rot, my father had propped it up with bricks. Although we had electric lights in the workshop, we were not allowed to have them in the caravan, but we had a wood-burning stove to keep us warm in winter, a paraffin burner on which to boil a kettle or cook a stew, and a paraffin lamp hanging from the ceiling. I really loved living in that gypsy caravan. I loved it especially in the evenings, when I was tucked up in my bunk and my father was telling me stories. You might think, if you didn't know him well, that my father was a stern and serious person because he never smiled with his mouth. He did it all with his eyes. I was glad my father was an eye smiler. It meant he never gave me a fake smile because it's impossible to make your eyes twinkle if you aren't feeling twinkly yourself. My father was not what you would call an educated man and I doubt if he'd read 20 books in his life but he was a wildly funny person and a marvellous storyteller. Now, snuggle down in your bunk and I'll tell you some more about the BFG. The big friendly giant? Yes, the big friendly giant makes his magic powders out of the dreams the children dream when they are asleep. How? Tell me how, Dad. Dreams, my love, are very mysterious things. They float around in the night air, searching for sleeping people. How does the big friendly giant catch them? A dream makes a tiny little buzzing humming sound. A sound so soft, it is impossible for ordinary people to hear it. But the BFG's sense of hearing is absolutely fantastic. He can hear the tread of a ladybird's footsteps as she walks across a leaf. What happens when he catches the dreams? He imprisons them in glass bottles and screws the lids down tight. Does he catch bad dreams as well as good ones? Yes, he catches both, but he only uses the good ones in his powders. What does he do with the bad ones? He explodes them. Have you ever actually seen the big friendly giant? Only once. Where? I was out behind the caravan, and it was a clear moonlit night. And I happened to look up, and suddenly I saw this tremendous tall person running along the crest of the hill. And when he came to the high hawthorn hedge at the end of the field, he just strode over it as if it wasn't there. 
Were you frightened, Dad? No. It was a little eerie, but I wasn't frightened. I'll go to sleep. Good night. My father was a fine mechanic. People from miles away used to bring their cars to him for repair. He loved engines. A petrol engine, Danny, is sheer magic. Just imagine being able to take a thousand different bits of metal, and if you fit them all together in a certain way, and then if you feed them a little oil and petrol, and if you press a little switch, suddenly those bits of metal will come to life. It was inevitable that I too should fall in love with engines and cars. My toys were the greasy cogs and springs and pistons that lay around the place, and these were far more fun to play with than most of the plastic stuff children are given these days. I should, by law, have started school when I was five. I was in the workshop helping my father fit new brake linings to the rear wheel of a big Ford on my fifth birthday. You know something interesting, Danny? You must be easily the best five-year-old mechanic in the world. I want to teach you to be a great mechanic, and when you grow up, you will become a famous designing engineer. For that, you will need a really good education. But I don't want to send you to school quite yet. In another two years, you will have learned enough here from me to be able to take a small engine to pieces and put it together again all by yourself. After that, you can go to school. So, two more years went by, and at the age of seven. I really could take a small engine to pieces and put it together again. The time had come to start school. My school was in the nearest village, two miles away. We couldn't afford a car of our own, so I used to walk. My father came with me, and when school ended in the afternoon, he was always there waiting to walk me home. And so life went on. But I was never bored. It was impossible to be bored in my father's company. He was too sparky a man for that. One windy day, he made me a kite, and we flew it together from the top of the hill behind the filling station. Not long after, on a lovely still evening, when there was no breath of wind anywhere, my father said to me, "This is just the right weather for a fire balloon. Let's make a fire balloon. All we need is some tissue paper, glue, and a bit of thin wire." He made me a magnificent fire balloon in less than fifteen minutes. In the opening at the bottom, he tied a ball of cotton wool, and we carried it outside into the field behind the caravan. Hold the sides out as much as you can, Danny. I'll just pour some methylated spirit over the cotton wool. Now, I'll put a match to it. It'll catch fire. No, it won't. Watch, see, she's nearly ready. Can you feel her floating? Yes. Shall we let her go? Not yet. Wait until she's tugging to fly away. She's tugging now. Right, let her go. It flies! It flies! It flies! Ah, this one's a real beauty. You never know how they're going to turn out until you fly them. She's going up fast now, like a magic fireball in the sky. Will other people see it? Oh, I'm sure they will, Danny. What will they think it is, Dad? A flying saucer. They'll probably call the police. We lost sight of it in the night sky when the flames went out and the balloon started to come down. But the next morning, I went out and searched for it. It had come to no harm, so I carried it home and hung it alongside the kite against a wall in the workshop for another day. You can fly the kite all by yourself any time you like, but you must never fly the fire balloon unless I'm with you. It's extremely dangerous. All right. I promise me you'll never try to fly it alone, Danny. I promise. Then there was the tree house we built high up in the top of the big oak tree, and the bow and arrow. The stilts that made me ten feet tall, the boomerang that comes back to me and falls at my feet nearly every time I throw it, and Sopo. Sopo, the amazing machine my father made me in secret for my eighth birthday, with four wheels, a brake pedal, a steering wheel, a comfortable seat, and a bumper to take the shock of a crash. So you see. That being eight years old and living with my father was a lot of fun, but I was impatient to be nine. I reckoned that being nine would be even more fun than being eight. I was not altogether right about this. My ninth year was certainly more exciting than the others, but not all of it was exactly what you would call fun. It all started on a Saturday. It was the first Saturday of September. For some reason, I woke up during the night. 
I lay still, listening for the sound of my father's breathing in the bunk above mine. I could hear nothing. No sound came from the workshop. The filling station was silent. I got up and found a box of matches. I struck one and held it up to the clock. It's ten past eleven. Dad? Dad, are you there? Dad, where are you? I'm sure Dad would never leave me alone at night. He must have fainted suddenly from an awful illness or fallen down and banged his head. I looked everywhere, but he was nowhere to be found. At last, I took a blanket from my bunk and put it round my shoulders and sat at the open door of the caravan. There was a new moon in the sky and across the road the big field lay pale and deserted in the moonlight. The silence was deathly. Then, at last, I heard the faint tap tap of footsteps on the road. Was it him? Or was it somebody else? It was him. Danny, what on earth's the matter? I thought something awful had happened to you. Oh, I'm so sorry. I should never have done it. Now, come on. Let me tuck you back into your bunk. You don't usually wake up, do you? Where did you go, Dad? You must be tired out. I'm not a bit tired. Couldn't we light the lamp for a little while? Uh, I don't see why not. How about a hot drink? Yes, please. I have decided something. I'm going to let you in on the deepest, darkest secret of my whole life. You asked me where I'd been. The truth is, I was up in Hazel's Wood. Hazel's Wood? That's miles away. Mm, six miles and a half. I know I shouldn't have gone, and I'm very, very sorry about it. But I had such a powerful yearning. But why should you want to go all the way up to Hazel's Wood? Do you know what is meant by poaching? Poaching? Not really. It means going up into the woods at dead of night and coming back with something for the pot. Poachers in other places poach all sorts of different things. But around here, it's always pheasants. You mean stealing them? Oh, we don't look at it that way. Poaching is an art. A great poacher is a great artist. Is that actually what you were doing in Hazel's Wood, Dad? Poaching pheasants? I was practising the art. The art of poaching. I was shocked. I couldn't believe my father would go creeping into the woods at night to pinch valuable birds belonging to somebody else. The kettle's boiling. Ah, so it is. I'll make the cocoa. Your granddad, my own dad, was a magnificent and splendiferous poacher. It was he who taught me all about it. I caught the poaching fever from him when I was ten years old, and I've never lost it since. Mind you, in those days, just about every man in our village was out in the woods at night poaching pheasants. And they did it not only because they loved the sport, but because they needed food for their families. When I was a boy, times were bad for a lot of people in England. There was very little work to be had anywhere, and some families were literally starving. Yet a few miles away in the rich man's wood, thousands of pheasants were being fed like kings twice a day. So can you blame my dad for going out occasionally and coming home with a bird or two for the family to eat? No, of course not. But we're not starving here, Dad. Ah, you've missed the point, Danny boy. Poaching is such a fabulous and exciting sport, it gets into your blood and you can't give it up. Just imagine for a moment that you are all alone up there in the dark wood and the wood is full of keepers hiding behind the trees and the keepers have guns. They don't have guns. All keepers have guns, for the foxes and stoats and weasels who go after the pheasants mostly, but they'll always take a pot at a poacher. You're joking. Not at all. But they only do it from behind, only when you're trying to escape. They could go to prison for shooting someone. You could go to prison for poaching. <laughs> Many's the night when I was a boy. I've gone into the kitchen <laughs> and seen my old dad lying face down on the table, a mum standing over him, digging the gunshot pellets out of his backside with a potato knife. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> Towards the end, he was so covered in tiny white scars, he looked exactly like it was snowing. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. <laughs> It's not funny. It's horrible. <laughs> Poacher's bottom, they used to call it. And there wasn't a man in the village who didn't have a bit of it. But my dad was the champion. How's the cocoa? 
Fine, thank you. If you're hungry, we could have a midnight feast. Could we, Dad? Of course. I'll make some sandwiches. Let me tell you about this phony pheasant shooting business. First of all, it's practiced only by the rich. Only the very rich can afford to rear pheasants just for the fun of shooting them down when they grow up. They are guarded by keepers and fed twice a day on the best corn until they're so fat they can hardly fly. Then beaters are hired who walk through the woods making as much noise as they can to drive the half-tame birds towards the half-baked men and their guns. Would you like strawberry jam on one of these? Yes, please. But how do you actually catch the pheasants when you're poaching? Do you have a gun hidden up there? A gun? Real poachers don't shoot pheasant, Daddy. You've only got to fire a cat pistol up in those woods and the keepers will be on to you. Then how do you do it? Ah, these things are big secrets. Very big secrets indeed. But I reckon if my father could tell them to me, then maybe I can tell them to you. Yes, tell me now. All the best ways of poaching pheasants were discovered by my old dad. He actually kept a flock of prime roosters in the backyard just to practice on. So whenever he thought up a new method of catching pheasants, he tried it out on a rooster first to see if it worked. What are the best ways? Uh, promise you won't tell another soul. I promise. Here's the first big secret. The most important discovery in the whole history of poaching. Pheasants are crazy about raisins. Raisins? You throw a few raisins into a bunch of pheasants and they'll start fighting each other to get at them. My dad discovered that just as he discovered these other things. Method number one is known as the horsehair stopper. And the reason it's such a brilliant method is that it's completely silent. There's no squawking or flapping when the pheasant is caught. How does it work? It's very simple. You soak a few raisins in water overnight to make them plump and soft and juicy. Then you get a bit of stiff horse hair and you cut it up into half inch lengths and stick one of these lengths through the middle of a raisin so there's just a tiny bit of horse hair sticking out on each side. When evening comes, you creep into the woods and scatter the raisins. Soon along comes a pheasant and gobbles it up. What happens then? Uh, Here's what my dad discovered. The horse hair makes the raisin stick in the pheasant's throat. It doesn't hurt him, but after that, believe it or not, the pheasant never moves his feet again. And all you've got to do is nip out quickly from the place where you are hiding and pick him up. Is that really true, Dad? I swear it. That's method number one. What's number two? Ah, number two's a real beauty. It's a flash of pure brilliance. My dad discovered that if he put a little paper hat over a rooster's head and covered its eyes, it wouldn't run away. But, Dad, how do you get a paper hat over a pheasant's head? Listen carefully. First of all, you dig a little hole in the ground. Then you twist a piece of paper into the shape of a cone and fit this into the hole. Then you smear the inside of the cup with glue and drop in a few raisins. When the old pheasant pops his head inside to gobble up the raisins, the next thing he knows, he's got a paper hat stuck over his eyes and he can't see a thing. My dad called it the sticky hat method. Is that the one you used this evening? Mm. How many did you get? Well, actually, I didn't get any. I arrived too late. The pheasants were already going up into the trees to roost. That shows how out of practice I am. Was it fun all the same? Marvellous. Absolutely marvellous. Just like the old days. Have you been doing this often after I've gone to sleep, without me knowing it? Uh, no. Tonight was the first time for nine years. When your mother died, I made a vow to give up poaching until you were old enough to be left alone at nights. But this evening, I had such a tremendous longing to go up into the woods again. I just couldn't stop myself. If you ever want to go again, I won't mind. Do you really mean that? Yes, so long as you tell me beforehand. Good boy. And we'll have roast pheasant for supper whenever you want it. And one day, Dad, will you take me with you? Mm, I reckon you're a bit young. I wouldn't want you to get peppered with buckshot in the backside at your age. Your dad took you at my age? Mm, we'll see how it goes. Yes. I wouldn't want to take you with me until I'm right back in my old form. No. Would you mind if I went out next Saturday night? You mean poaching? Yes. 
Will it be Hazel's Wood again? It'll always be Hazel's Wood. First, because that's where all the pheasants are. And second, because I don't like Mr Hazel one little bit. And it's a pleasure to poach his birds. I haven't forgotten the way he spoke to you last year when he came in for a fill-up. Mr Victor Hazel owned a huge brewery. He was rich beyond words, and all the land around us belonged to him. He was a roaring snob, and he tried desperately to get in with what he believed were the, the right kind of people. He hunted with the hounds and gave shooting parties and wore fancy waistcoats. Previous year, he'd pull up alongside the pumps in his gleaming Rolls Royce. Fill her up, boy, and look sharp about it. You keep your filthy little ends to yourself, you understand? No, sir. What, what do you mean, sir? If you make any dirty finger marks on my paintwork, I'll step right out of this car and give you a good hard in with this riding crop. That's enough. I don't like you speaking to my son like that. Next time you threaten someone with a good hiding, I suggest you pick on a person your own size. Like me, for instance. Now go away, please. We do not wish to serve you. Mr. Hazel did not look at my father. He sat quite still, his tiny piggy eyes staring straight ahead. There was a smug, superior smile around the corners of his mouth. He drove away fast in a cloud of dust. The very next day, an inspector from the Department of Health came to inspect our caravan. I need to check that it's fit for humans to live in. We don't allow people to live in dirty, broken-down shacks these days. The inspector had to admit that there was nothing wrong with our caravan, but hardly a week went by without some local official dropping in to check up on one thing or another. There was little doubt that Mr Hazel was trying to run us off our land, so you can see why it gave my father pleasure to poach his pheasants. On the Saturday, I helped my father in the workshop decarbonising the cylinders of an Austin 7. A great little car built in 1933 which still ran as sweetly as ever it did. The excitement of going poaching in the evening was building up inside my father. I want to be away by six o'clock. Then I will get to the wood exactly at twilight. Why don't you wait until it's really dark? Then you wouldn't be seen at all. You wouldn't catch anything if you did that. When night comes on, all the pheasants fly up into the trees to roost. Are you going to use the sticky hat or will it be the horsehair stopper? Sticky hat. I'm very fond of sticky hat. You will be all right, won't you, Dad? Oh, don't worry about me. There aren't many keepers in Hazel's Wood nowadays. Not too many at all. At six o'clock precisely, my father kissed me goodbye. Promise not to wait up for me, Danny. Put yourself to bed at eight and go to sleep. He set off down the road with that long, loping stride all countrymen have who are used to covering great distances on foot and disappeared round a bend in the road. I tried to do some homework, but it was impossible to keep my mind on it. I pictured my father in his old navy blue sweater and peak cap, walking soft-footed up the track towards the wood. He wore the sweater because navy blue hardly showed up in the dark, and the peak of the cap cast a shadow over the face. I closed my books and went to bed instead. I left the lamp burning and soon fell asleep. When I opened my eyes again, the clock said ten minutes past two. Ten minutes past two? He promised he'd be home by 10.30 at the latest. He's been gone over eight hours now. Perhaps the keepers have shot him up so badly he can't walk. Perhaps he's lying in the wood bleeding to death. I must get dressed. I must go and find him. I ran across to the workshop to get a torch. The moon had long disappeared, but the sky was clear. There was no wind, no sound of any kind. To my right lay the lonely road that led to the dangerous wood six and a half miles away. It's going to be a hard slog. But why shouldn't I go in the baby Austin? I know how to drive. Dad lets me move the cars around the workshop in first gear. I'll get to the wood much quicker if I go by car. This is an emergency. I opened the double doors of the workshop and got into the driver's seat of the baby Austin and pressed the starter. I pressed down the clutch pedal and pushed the gear lever into first. 
I released the clutch very slowly. At the same time, I pressed down just a fraction of an inch on the accelerator and stealthily, oh, most wonderfully, the little car began to steal into motion. He crept out of the filling station onto the dark, deserted road. I won't pretend I wasn't frightened, but mixed in with the awful fear was a glorious feeling of excitement. The road seemed awfully narrow in the dark. I must change into second gear or the engine will get too hot. Here goes. How fast am I going? Fifteen miles an hour. How long will it take me to do six miles? At sixty miles an hour, six miles would take six minutes. At fifteen, it will take twenty-four minutes. I must change gear again, up into third. Now we're doing thirty. I'll soon be there now. Hazel's wood was not on the main road. You had to turn off through a gap in the hedge and go uphill over a bumpy track for a quarter of a mile. If the ground was wet, I'd never get the car up there. Thank goodness we haven't had any rain for a week. I must be close to the turning place now. What's that ahead? Oh no, there's another car coming towards me. It's a police car. <sighs> that was close. The police car went past me like a bullet. I was certain they would stop. Any policeman in the world would stop if he suddenly passed a small boy in a tiny car chugging along a lonely road at half past two in the morning. All at once, I came to the turning. I swerved into it behind the hedge and stopped. I turned off the lights. The police car had pulled up about fifty yards down the road. It turned and came back fast. It passed the place where I was hiding and raced away into the night. Thank goodness! It means they didn't see me swing off the road. But how long before they realise they've missed me? They're coming back again, gone past again. He's certainly gunning that engine. He must be very angry. Perhaps he thinks he's seen a ghost, a ghost boy driving a ghost car. I waited to see if the police car would come back again. It didn't. So I switched my lights on again and pressed the starter. I drove very slowly along the bumpy track. Soon I was there. The immense trees of Hazel's wood rose up towards the sky. I squeezed through the hedge, dividing the wood from the track. The darkness was so solid around me, I could almost touch it. Dad, Dad, are you there? I listened for an answer, but none came. I listened and listened. I had a queer feeling that the whole wood was listening with me. Even the silence was listening. Silence was listening to silence. I switched on the torch. The keepers will be able to see it, but I didn't care about the keepers any more. The only person I cared about was my father. I went deeper into the wood. Dad, Dad, it's Danny. Are you there? Oh, Dad, please tell me where you are. Please answer me. Please, oh, please. I stood still, listening, listening, listening. I'm here, Dad. It's Danny. Where are you? Over here. Where are you, Danny? I'm here, Dad. I'm coming. Stop, Danny. Stop. Where are you, Dad? I'm down here. Come forward slowly, but be careful. Don't fall in. Dad. Hello, my marvelous darling. Thank you for coming. Are you all right, Dad? My ankle seems to be broken. It happened when I fell into this pit. It's deep. Must be twelve feet. They must have used a mechanical digger. The sides are so straight, no one could climb out without help. Does your ankle hurt? Yeah, 
It hurts a lot. But don't worry about that. I've got to get out of here before morning. The keepers know I'm here and they're coming back for me as soon as it gets light. Did they dig the hole to catch people? Yes. Do they know who you are? No. Two of them came and shone a light on me. But I covered my face with my arms. They were trying to guess who I was. But they didn't mention my name. Guess who's coming with us to fish you out in the morning? One of them shouted. I didn't answer. I didn't want them to hear my voice. Mr. Victor Hazel is coming with us, he said. I hate to think what he's going to do when he gets his hands on you. Then they laughed and went away. Oh, ouch. My poor ankle. Oh, shine the light down here so I can see what time it is. Thanks. It's ten to three. I must be out of here before sunrise. Dad, I brought the car. I came in the baby Austin. You what? I wanted to get here quickly. You mean you actually drove here in the baby Austin? Yes. You're crazy. You could have been killed. It went fine, Dad. Ow. Are you all right? Yes, I'm fine. If we could get you out, I'm sure I could help you to the car. You could lean on me and hop on one leg. Uh, I'll never get out of here without a ladder. Wouldn't a rope do? It's, of course a rope would do it. There's one in the baby Austin. A tow rope under the back seat. I'll get it. Wait here, Dad. I ran all the way to the car, found the rope and slung it over my shoulder. Then I ran back to the pit. I've got the rope, Dad. Good. Now tie one end of it to the nearest tree. Right, I've done that. Here comes the other end, down to you. Got it? Yeah. Cheap. This ankle hurts. Do you think you can make it, Dad? I've got to make it. I've got to climb this rope with hands only. You can do it, Dad. Uh, oh, I, I, uh, 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 oh. Help me up, Danny. That's it. I'll hold my left foot just clear of the ground and lean on you with both hands. Now, let's see how well I can hop forward on one leg. Here we go. Does it hurt terribly, Dad? Uh, it does when I hop. Each time I hop, it jars it. I keep going. Come on. We can make it. There's the hedge. We're nearly there. I'm not quite sure how we got through that hedge. But little by little, we squeezed through and sat on the grassy bank under the hedge to get a breather. It's four o'clock. The sun won't be up for another two hours. We've got plenty of time. Shall I drive? Yeah, you'll have to. I've only got one foot. The rope. We left it behind. Oh, forget it. Doesn't matter. It must have been agony for my father getting into that little car. I got into the driver's seat beside him and drove back to the filling station. I'll have to go to hospital with this ankle. How long will you be in hospital? Oh, don't worry. I'll be home before evening. Should we go to the hospital now? Uh, no. I'll just lie down on the floor of the workshop and wait till it's time to call Doc Spencer. He'll arrange everything. What will you tell him, Dad? I mean, about how it happened. I'll tell him the truth. Doc Spencer is my friend. I helped my father into the workshop and made him comfortable as possible with blankets on the floor. Thanks, Danny. I'll put the phone down here so I can reach it. Can I get you anything, Dad? Uh, no, thank you. I mustn't have a thing. I'm going to have an anaesthetic soon. And you mustn't eat or drink anything at all before that. But you must have something. Go and make yourself breakfast. Then go to bed. I'd like to wait here till the doctor comes. Oh, you must be dead tired, Danny. I'm all right. I sat on a chair beside him. He seemed to doze off, and I must have gone to sleep too, because the next thing I heard was Doc Spencer. Well, my goodness me, William. What on earth have you been up to? My father once told me 
that Doc Spencer had been looking after the people of our district for nearly 45 years. He was over 70 now and could have retired long ago, but he didn't want to retire and his patients didn't want him to either. He was a tiny man with a face as brown and wrinkled as a shriveled apple. He was some sort of elf, I used to think to myself. Nobody feared him. Many people loved him. He peered at my father through steel-rimmed spectacles. Which ankle? Uh, the left one. Oh, let's have a look at it then. Hmm. Oh, it's a nasty one. You'd better get you into hospital right away. May I use your phone? He called the hospital and asked for an ambulance. And then he came back to my father. How on earth did you do it, William? Did you fall down the steps of that crazy caravan? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, I was mooching around up in Hazel's Wood. Ah, ah, yes, I see. What's it like up there these days? Plenty of pheasants? <laughs> Stacks of them. Ah, it's a great game. I only wish I was young enough to have another go at it. You didn't know I used to do a bit of poaching myself, did you, Danny? No. Ah, many a night. After evening surgery was over, I used to slip out to one of my secret places. Sometimes it was pheasant. Other times it was trout. Oh, which method did you use for the pheasants? Oh, gin and raisins. You used to soak the raisins in gin for a week and then scatter them in the woods. It doesn't work. I <laughs> know it doesn't. But it was enormous fun. And I was hot stuff with trout. Do you know how to catch a trout, Danny? Without using a rod and line? No, how? You tickle him. Tickle him? <laughs> yes. You you go creeping along the river bank until you see a big one, and you lie on your tummy, and then very slowly you lower your hand into the water behind him and slide it underneath him, and you begin to stroke his belly up and down with the tip of one finger. Will he really let you do that? Oh, he loves it. He loves it so much he sort of dozes off. And then you quickly grab hold of him and flip him out of the water onto the bank. Only a great artist can do it. I take my hat off to you, sir. Thank you, William. Uh, by the way, what happened up there in the woods? Did you step in a rabbit hole? It was a slightly bigger hole than that. Mr. Hazel has had a pit trap dug. Oh, I don't believe it. It's perfectly true. Ask Danny. It was horribly deep. But great heavens alive, he can't do that. Victor Hazel can't go digging tiger traps in his woods for human beings. It's rotten. Ah, oh, it's worse than that, William. It's diabolical. I never did like that, Victor Hazel. I, uh, I saw him do a filthy thing once. What? He had an appointment with me at the surgery. He needed an injection of some sort. Now, my old dog, Bertie, was dozing on the doorstep, and instead of stepping over him, he actually kicked him out of the way with his riding boot. What did you do? Now, I left him sitting in the waiting room while I picked out the oldest, bluntest needle I could find. And then... I rubbed the point on a nail file to make it blunter still. <laughs> then I called him in and told him to lower his pants and bend over. And then I rammed that needle into his fleshy backside. <laughs> he screamed like a stuck pig. Oh, oh, hooray! <laughs> He's never been back since. <laughs> ah, there is the ambulance. Doc Spencer took a leg splint from the ambulance and strapped up my father's leg. Then the ambulance men brought in a stretcher, and my father got onto it by himself. I think you'd better come home with me, young man. You can stay with us until your father's back from hospital. Won't he be home today? Yes, I'll be back this evening. You know, I'd rather you stayed in for the night. I shall come home this evening. Thank you for offering to take Danny, but it won't be necessary. I reckon he'll sleep most of the day anyway, won't you? I think so. They carried my father into the ambulance and I watched the big white thing drive out of the filling station. The marvellous little doctor got into his car and drove off after the ambulance and I just flopped down on my bunk and went to sleep. More than ten hours later, at 6.30 in the evening, I was woken up by the ambulance men bringing my father home. They laid him on his bunk and he dozed off almost immediately. As the ambulance men drove away, Doc Spencer arrived to take a look at the patient. Ah, oh, he'll sleep until tomorrow morning. I'm awfully glad he's home. When did you last have something to eat, Danny? Something to eat? Oh, well, um, 
I had, um... You've had nothing since supper last night. Now, that's 24 hours ago. Here, my wife asked me to give you this. I think you'll like it. She's a terrific cook. He pushed something huge and round, wrapped up in greaseproof paper towards me. Then he jumped into his car and drove away. When I unwrapped the parcel, I saw before me the most enormous and beautiful pie in the world. The meat inside was pink and tender, and there were hard-boiled eggs buried like treasures in several different places. Mmm, this is fabulous. God bless Dr. Spencer. God bless Mrs. Spencer as well. The next morning, my father was up at six, and he started hobbling around the caravan to test his leg. Hard white plaster covered the lower part of it and the whole of his foot, except for the toes. There was a funny little iron thing sticking out below the foot for him to walk on. I feel great. It hardly hurts at all. I can walk you to school. No, Dad, no. I've never missed one yet, Danny. It's two miles each way. Don't do it, Dad, please. So that day, I went to school alone. But he insisted on coming with me the next day. He walked a bit stiff-legged, but he moved as fast as ever and the metal thing went clink on the road every time he put it down. And so life at the filling station returned to normal. Or anyway, nearly to normal. A change had come over my father. Something seemed to be worrying him quite a lot. About ten days after his return from hospital, we sat on the platform of the caravan after supper. The September evening was warm and beautiful and very still. You know what makes me so hopping mad, Danny? I get up in the mornings feeling pretty good. Then about nine o'clock every single day of the week, that huge silver Rolls Royce comes swishing past the filling station and I can see the great bloated face of Mr. Victor Hazel behind the wheel. There's a sneer under his nose. And although I only see him for three seconds, it makes me madder than mackerel. I don't blame you. Now, I'll tell you something interesting. The shooting season for pheasants starts on Saturday. It always starts on the 1st of October, and every year Mr. Hazel celebrates the occasion by giving a grand opening day shooting party. Do lots of people come? Oh, hundreds. Dukes and lords, barons and baronets, wealthy businessmen and all the fancy folk in the county. But they don't come because they like Mr. Hazel. Secretly, they think he's a nasty piece of work. Then why do they come, Dad? Because it's the best pheasant shoot in the south of England. But to Mr. Hazel, it is the greatest day in the year, and he's willing to pay almost anything to make it a success. And do you know why? Why, Dad? It makes him feel important. For one day in the year, he becomes a big cheese in a little world, and even the Duke of So-and-So slaps him on the back and tries to remember his first name when he says goodbye. Do you know what I would dearly love to do right now? What, Dad? It's a deadly secret, Danny. I would like to find a way of poaching so many pheasants from Hazel's Wood that there wouldn't be any left for the big opening day shoot on October the 1st. Dad, no! Shh! Listen. If only I could find a way of knocking off a couple of hundred birds all in one go, then Mr. Hazel's party would be the biggest washout in history. Two hundred? That's impossible. Just imagine, Danny. What a triumph. What a glorious victory it would be. All the dukes and lords and famous men would arrive in their big cars. Out they would all go with their guns under their arms. And there wouldn't be a single pheasant to be found anywhere. And Mr. Victor Hazel's face would be redder than a boiled beetroot. Now, wouldn't that be the most fantastic, marvellous thing if we could pull it off? Yes. Yeah, but how... How could it be done? There's no way, Dad. I know. It's the keepers that make it so difficult. Um, do they stay right through the night? No, they go off home as soon as all the pheasants are safely up in the trees roosting. But nobody's ever discovered a way of poaching a roosting pheasant. Not even my own dad, who was the greatest expert in the world. Now, it's about your bedtime. Off you go and I'll come in and tell you a story. Five minutes later, I was lying on my bunk in my pyjamas. My father came in, lit the oil lamp hanging from the ceiling. It was getting dark earlier now. 
All right. What sort of story shall we have tonight? Dad, wait a minute. What is it? I've just had a bit of an idea. What sort of an idea have you had, Danny? You know that bottle of sleeping pills Doc Spencer gave you when you came back from hospital? Oh, I never used them. Don't like the things. Yes, but is there any reason why those wouldn't work on a pheasant? No, Danny. Wait! It's no use, Danny. No pheasant in the world is going to swallow those lousy red capsules. Surely you know that. You're forgetting the raisins, Dad. The raisins? What's that got to do with it? Now listen. Please listen. We take a raisin, we soak it until it swells, then we make a tiny slit in one side of it with a razor blade. Then we hollow it out a little, then we open up one of your red capsules and pour all the powder into the raisin. Then we get a needle and thread, and very carefully we sharp the slit. Now we have a nice clean looking raisin chock full of sleeping powder, and that ought to be enough to put any pheasant to sleep. Don't you think so? Oh, my darling boy. Oh, my sainted aunt. I do believe you've got it. Yes, I do. I do. I do. You really think it'll work? Yes, it'll work all right. With this method, we could prepare 200 raisins, and all we'd have to do is scatter them round the feeding grounds at sunset, and then walk away. Half an hour later, after it was dark and the keepers had all gone home, we would go back into the wood and the pheasants would be up in the trees by then roosting. And the pills would be beginning to work. And the pheasants would be starting to feel groggy. They'd be wobbling and trying to keep their balance. And soon every pheasant that had eaten one single raisin would topple over unconscious and fall to the ground. Why, they'd be dropping out of the trees like apples. And all we'd have to do is to walk around picking them up. Can I do it with you, Dad? And they'd never catch us either. We'd simply stroll through the woods, dropping a few raisins here and there as we went. And even if they were watching us, they wouldn't notice anything. Dad, will you let me come with you? Danny, my love! If this thing works, it will revolutionise poaching. Yes, Dad. But can I come with you? Come with me? But, my dear boy, of course you can come with me. It's your idea. You must be there to see it happening. Now then, where are those pills? Ah, there they are. Now, let's tip them out of the bottle and count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We counted them together. Forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty. There are exactly fifty. That's not enough. We need 200 at least. Uh, no, wait. Hold it. There's no problem. All we've got to do, Danny, is divide the powder from one capsule among four raisins. In other words, quarter the dose. That way we'd have enough to fill 200 raisins. But would a quarter of those pills be strong enough to put a pheasant to sleep? Of course it would, my dear boy. Work it out for yourself. How much smaller is a pheasant than a man? Many, many times smaller. Mm, there you are, then. If one pill is enough to put a fully grown man to sleep, you'll only need a tiny bit of that for a pheasant. What we're going to give him will knock the old pheasant for a loop. He won't know what's hit him. But, Dad, 200 raisins aren't going to get you 200 pheasants. Why not? Because the greediest birds are surely going to gobble up about 10 raisins each. Mm, you've got a point there. You certainly have. But somehow, I don't think it will happen that way if I'm careful and spread them out over a wide area. And you promise I can come with you? Absolutely. And we shall call this method the Sleeping Beauty. It will be a landmark in the history of poaching. Ah, oh, it's exciting, isn't it? I don't dare think about it. It makes me shiver all over. Uh, me too. But we must make our plans very, very carefully. Today is Wednesday. The shooting party is next Saturday. Cripes! That's in three days' time. When do we go up to the wood and do the job? The night before. That way they won't find out that all the pheasants have disappeared until it's too late. So, here's the plan of action. Tomorrow is Thursday. When I walk you to school, I shall go into Cooper's stores in the village and buy two packets of seedless raisins. In the evening, we'll put the raisins in to soak for the night. 
That only gives us Friday to get ready 200 raisins, and I'll be at school all day. No, you won't. You will be suffering from a nasty cold, and I shall be forced to keep you home from school. Hooray! We won't open the filling station at all on Friday. We'll shut ourselves in the caravan and prepare the raisins. And that evening, we go to the woods. Is that clear? All clear. And Danny, not a whisper of this to any of your friends at school. Dad, you know I wouldn't. The next day was Thursday. My father walked with me to the village as usual and went into Cooper's stores for the raisins while I went into school. There are about 60 boys and girls in our school and their ages went from 5 to 11. We had four classrooms and four teachers. Miss Birdseye taught the five and six-year-olds and she was a really nice person. The seven and eight-year-olds were taught by Mr Corrado. He was a very old teacher but that didn't seem to stop him being in love with Miss Birdseye. We knew he was in love with her because he always gave her the best bits of meat at lunch when it was his turn to do the serving. Mr Snoddy, our headmaster, took the top form and everybody liked him. A funny thing about Mr Snoddy was that he always brought a glass of water into class and sipped it all through the lesson. At least everybody thought it was water except me and my best friend Sidney Morgan. We once saw Mr Snoddy refilling his famous glass of water from a bottle labelled Gordon's Gin. The only person I told was my father. I don't blame him one bit. If I was unlucky enough to be married to Mrs Snoddy, I'd drink something a bit stronger than gin. What would you drink, Dad? Poison. She's a frightful woman. She's a sort of witch. My teacher was called Captain Lancaster. He had fiery carrot-coloured hair and a little clipped carroty moustache and a fiery temper. He was a violent man and we were all terrified of him. Something horrible happened on the morning my father left me to buy the raisins. We were having our first lesson of the day with Captain Lancaster. Turn to page 31 of your arithmetic books and work out all the multiplication sums in your exercise books without a word. Danny, what are eight nines? 72, Sydney. You, stand up. Me, sir? Yes, you, you blithering little idiot. You were talking. What were you saying? Come on, boy, out with it. Are you refusing to answer me? Please, sir, it was my fault. I, I asked him a question. Oh, you did, did you? Stand up. And what exactly did you ask him? I, I asked him, what are eight nines? And I suppose you answered him. Did you answer him or didn't you? Speak up, boy. Yes, sir. So, you were cheating. Both of you were cheating. Cheating is a repulsive habit practiced by gutter snipes and dandy prats. You may be permitted to cheat and lie and swindle in your own homes, but I will not put up with it here. I'm not a cheat. You are not only a cheat, but you are insolent. Come up here, both of you. Now, you know what this is, don't you? This long white cane? You first. Hold out your hand. Oh, that fearful, searing, burning pain across my hand. Why didn't it go away? I glanced at Sydney. He was doing just the same as me, squeezing his hand between his legs and making the most awful face. Go and sit down, both of you, and get on with your work, and let us have no more cheating. I looked at my hand. There was a long, ugly scarlet mark right across the palm. My fingers moved all right, but it hurt to move them. When I got home from school that afternoon, I helped my father put the raisins into a bowl of water to soak. Hey, Danny. What's happened to your hand? It's nothing. Who did it? Was it Captain Lancaster? Yes, Dad, but it's nothing. What happened? Tell me exactly what happened. I told him everything. He stood there, his face going whiter and whiter. I'll kill him. I swear I'll kill him. Forget it, Dad. Where are you going? I'm going straight to Captain Lancaster's house and I'm going to beat the daylights out of him. No, it'll ruin everything. It'll only make it worse. It's revolting. 
I bet they did it to you when you were at school. Of course they did. And I bet your dad didn't go rushing to beat the daylights out of the teacher who did it. No, Danny, he didn't. I'm going to put the raisins in to soak now. And don't forget that tomorrow I have a nasty cold and I won't be going to school. Uh, yes, that's right. We've got 200 raisins to fill. So we have. My father woke me at six o'clock next morning. It was the day I longed for and the day I dreaded. There weren't just butterflies in my stomach, there were snakes. The raisins were plump and soft and swollen. I slit them while my father opened the capsules and put a quarter of the white powder each contained into one of the raisins. Then each raisin was sewn up with a needle and cotton. Ah, oh, your mother was wonderful at sewing things. She'd have had these raisins done in no time. When Mum was here, Dad, did you go out very often at night? You mean poaching? Yes. Often. At least twice a week. Didn't she mind? Mind? Of course she didn't mind. She came with me. She didn't. She certainly did. Every single time until just before you were born. She had to stop then. She said she couldn't run fast enough. Weren't you afraid she might get shot up? Yes, Danny, I was. But it was marvellous to have her along. Well, it's time we took a break and had a bit of lunch. I'm not hungry. Don't worry. Same thing happened to me the first time I went out. My stomach was so jumpy I couldn't eat one mouthful. Mine's full of snakes. They won't stop wiggling about. Well, mine doesn't exactly feel normal either. But then, this isn't a normal operation, is it? No, Dad, it's not. This is the most colossal and extraordinary poaching job in the history of the world. Don't go on about it, Dad. It only makes me more jumpy. What time do we leave? We must enter the wood about 15 minutes before sunset, so we must arrive at 7.15 exactly. It's an hour and a half's walk to the wood, so we must leave here at a quarter to six. Then we'd better finish those raisins. We've still got more than 60 to do. We finish the raisins with two hours to spare. After that, we messed around in the workshop until half past five. All right, that's it. It's time to get ready. We leave in 15 minutes. My father came out of the caravan wearing his old navy blue sweater and brown cloth cap with a peak pulled down low over his eyes. There was a distinct bulge at his waistline. What's under there, Dad? Two cotton sacks, large enough to carry the stuff. Now go and put on your sweater. It's brown, isn't it? Yes. That'll do. But take off those white sneakers and wear your black shoes instead. It didn't take me long to change, and soon we were on our way to Hazel's Wood. Have you got the raisins, Dad? In my trouser pocket. This is it, Danny. We're on our way now. By golly, I wish my old dad were coming with us on this one. Mum too. Ah, oh, yes. Your mother would have loved this one. She was a great one for walking, Danny. And she would always bring something home with her to brighten up the caravan. In the summer, it was wild flowers. In the autumn, she picked branches of leaves. And in the winter, it was berries or old man's beard. How do you feel? Terrific. Do you think they might have dug any more of those pits for us to fall into? Don't you go worrying about pits. I shall be on the lookout for them this time. How dark will it be in there when we arrive? Oh, not too dark. Quite light, in fact. Then how do we stop the keepers from seeing us? Yeah, that's the fun of the whole thing. It's the greatest game of hide-and-seek in the whole world. You mean because they've got guns? Well, that does add a bit of flavour to it. I'll tell you something interesting about pheasants, Denny. The law says they're wild birds, so they only belong to you when they're on your own land. So if one of Mr Hazel's pheasants flew over and perched on our filling station, it would belong to us. No one else would be allowed to touch it. You mean even if Mr Hazel had bought it himself as a chick? Absolutely. Once it leaves his land, he's lost it. It's the same with all game. Hare, deer, partridge, grouse, you name it. We'd been walking steadily for about an hour and a quarter and we were coming to the gap in the hedge where the cart track led up the hill to the big wood where the pheasants lived. No talking, Danny, once we're inside. Keep very close to me and try not to go snapping any branches. In five minutes, we were there. My father was very tense. He picked his feet up high and put them down gently on the brown leaves. He kept his eyes moving all the time, searching for danger. I tried doing the same, but soon I began to see a keeper behind every tree, so I gave it up. The clearing we're making for is about a hundred yards ahead. We're going to have to crawl the next bit. Keep close behind me all the time and do exactly as I do, right? Right. Off we go, then. 
This is it. We crawled on and on, and at last we were kneeling safely behind a big clump of bushes right on the edge of the clearing. There you are, Danny. You see what I mean? It was a poacher's dream come true. The place was absolutely stiff with pheasants. There must have been at least 200 huge birds strutting around among the tree stumps. And there's a keeper. Where? Look carefully. Over the other side, by that big tree. Dad! Don't move now, Danny. Stay well down. Yes, but Dad, he's got a double-barreled shotgun. It's all right. He can't see us. I'm sure he's looking straight at us. Should we go? Shh! Keep your eyes on him. I'll toss a raisin into the clearing. There it goes. The keeper didn't move. That pheasant did, though. He gobbled that raisin up in no time. Let's give them some more. My father threw a second raisin into the clearing, then a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. He kept on throwing the raisins one at a time. Flick went his wrist, and up went the raisin, high over the bushes, to land among the pheasants. Then the keeper turned his head away to inspect the wood behind him. Quick as a flash, my father pulled the whole bag of raisins out of his pocket and with a great sweep of his arm, flung all of them into the clearing. There was a flurry of wings and a rush to find the treasure. The keeper's head flicked round as though there were a spring inside his neck. Lie down, Flat. Stay there. Don't move an inch. He's coming towards us. Don't you love this? All right. Panic's over. Follow me, Danny. But be extra careful. He's still there. And keep low down all the time. On your hands and knees. Come on. That's the way. Keep going. That's fine. That's far enough. Now run. It went marvellously. Didn't it go absolutely marvellously? Did the keeper see us? Not on your life. And in a few minutes, the sun will be going down. And those birds will be flying up to roost. And that keeper will be going home for his supper. Then all we have to do is to go back into the wood and help ourselves. You did well, Danny. I'm right proud of you. Come on. Let's sit down here on the bank under the hedge and wait for it to get dark. Ah, that's it. We did it, Danny. We pulled it off. Doesn't that make you feel good? Terrific. But it was a bit scary while it lasted. Ah, but that's what poaching's all about. It scares the pants off us. That's why we love it. How long does a sleeping pill take to work? I imagine it's about half an hour. It might be different with pheasants, though, Dad. It might. We've got to wait a while anyway to give the keepers time to go home. They'll be off as soon as it gets dark. Look out. There's someone coming. It's another keeper. Just sit tight and don't say a word. Good evening. I know you. I know the both of you. You're from the filling station, right? You're from the filling station and that's your boy and you live in that filthy old caravan, right? What are we playing at? Twenty questions? Beat it! Go on! Get out! This happens to be a public footpath. Kindly do not molest us. You're loitering with intent to commit a nuisance. I could run you in for that. No, you couldn't. I see you broke your foot. You didn't by any chance fall into a hole in the ground, did you? Up you get, Danny. It's been a nice walk, but it's time we went home for supper. Come along, we'll leave this gentleman to mind his own business. That's the headkeeper, Danny. His name is Rabbits. Do we have to go home, Dad? Home? My dear boy, we're just beginning. Come in here, over this gate and into the field. Mr. Rabbits is also due for his supper. We'll hide here until he goes by. We have to be careful of his dog. When they come by, hold your breath and don't move a muscle. Won't the dog smell us out anyway? No, there's no wind to carry the scent. Look out, here they come. one in the clearing. He'll be gone too. Isn't it a marvellous thought, though, Danny? 
There's about 200 pheasants at this very moment roosting up in those trees, and already they're beginning to feel groggy. Soon they'll be falling out of the branches like raindrops. We made our way back to the clearing in the wood. It was not as dark as I'd expected it to be. Little glints and glimmers from the brilliant moon outside shone through the leaves and gave the place a cold, eerie look. My father had also brought two small pocket torches, shaped like fountain pens. I switched mine on. It threw a long, narrow beam of surprising brightness. And when I moved it around, it was like waving a very long white wand among the trees. I switched it off. Here's where we threw the raisins. What do we do next? We stay here and wait. Are all the pheasants roosting? Yes, they're all around us. They don't go far. Could I see them if I shone my light up into the branches? No, they hide in among the leaves. Danny? Yes, Dad? I've been wondering how a bird manages to keep its balance sitting on a branch when it's asleep. I don't know. Why? It's very peculiar. What's peculiar? It's peculiar that a bird doesn't topple off its perch as soon as it goes to sleep. After all, if we were sitting on a branch and we went to sleep, we would fall off at once, wouldn't we? Birds have claws and long toes, Dad. I expect they held on with those. I know that, Danny. But I still don't understand why the toes keep gripping the perch once the bird is asleep. Surely everything goes limp when you get asleep. And I was thinking that if a bird can keep its balance when it's asleep, then surely there isn't any reason why the pool should make it fall down. It's doped. Surely it will fall down if it's doped. But isn't that simply a deeper sort of sleep? Why should we expect it to fall down just because it's in a deeper sleep? I should have tested it with the roosters. My dad would have tested it with roosters before he did anything else. What was that? Shh. There's another. They're pheasants. Wait. They must be pheasants, Dad. You may be right, Danny. Switch on your torch and let's have a look. Where were they? Over here, Dad. Two of them were over here. I thought they were this way. Keep looking. They can't be far. I can't find anything. Here's one. Shine your torch closer. Look like that. It's doped to high heaven. It won't wake up for a week. There's another. Two more. Jeepers. All around us, the pheasants were starting to rain down out of the trees. We began rushing round madly in the dark, sweeping the ground with our torches. My father was standing on the edge of the clearing with the moonlight streaming down all over him, a great bunch of pheasants in each hand. His face was bright, his eyes big and bright and wonderful, and he was staring around him like a child who's just discovered that the whole world is made of chocolate. It was easy to find them now. There were one or two lying under every tree. My father was in a whirl of excitement now, dashing about like a mad ghost under the trees. I could see the beam of his torch waving around in the dark. And every time he found a bird, he gave a little yelp of triumph. Hey, Danny. Yes, I'm over here. What do you think the great Mr. Victor Hazel would say if he could see this? Don't talk about it. There don't seem to be any more birds falling now. Keep searching. There's plenty more on the ground. Don't you think we ought to get out while the going's good? Never. Not on your life. Come on, pile them up. It looks like a bonfire of pheasants. It's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle. Shouldn't we take just about six each and get out quick? I would like to count them, Danny. Dad, not now. I must count them. Can't we do that later? One, two, three, four. He began counting them very carefully picking up each bird in turn and laying it carefully to one side. The moon was directly overhead now, and the whole clearing was brilliantly lit up. 117, 118, 119, 120. It's an all-time record. The most my dad ever got was 15, and he was drunk for a week afterwards. But this, this, my dad... Dear boy, here's an all-time world record. I expect it is. And you did it, Danny. The whole thing was your idea in the first place. I didn't do it, Dad. Oh, yes, you did. And you know what that makes you, my dear boy? It makes you the champion of the world. Ah, now, 
Let's fill up our sacks. Here's one for you. Come on, fill it up quick. You don't think that head keeper is watching us this very moment from behind a tree? No, no chance. If he's anywhere, he'd be down at the filling station waiting to catch us coming home with the loot. We can't possibly carry this lot all the way home. Of course not. There'll be a taxi waiting for us on the track outside the wood. A taxi? My dad always made use of a taxi on a big job. Why a taxi, for heaven's sake? It's more secret, Danny. Nobody knows who's inside a taxi except the driver. Which driver? Charlie Kinch. He's only too glad to oblige. Does he know about poaching too? Oh, Charlie Kinch? Of course he does. He's poached more pheasants in his time than we've sold gallons of petrol. We finished loading the sacks, and my father humped his onto his shoulders. I couldn't do that with mine. It was too heavy for me. So I dragged it over the dried leaves to the edge of the wood. My father peered through the hedge. Charlie boy. Hello, hello, hello. What's all this then? How about it, Charlie? How about this for a haul? Right. Are those sacks full of pheasants? They certainly are, Charlie. Now, let's get them into your taxi and get on our way. How did you do it? Danny did it. My son Danny is the champion of the world. I reckon pheasants is going to be a bit scarce up at Mr. Victor Hazel's opening day shoot tomorrow. Eh, hey, Willem? <laughs> I imagine they are, Charlie. I imagine they are. All those fancy folk driving in from miles around in their big shiny cars. And there won't be a blinking bird anywhere for them to shoot. Dad, what on earth are we going to do with all these pheasants? Share them out among our friends. There's a dozen of them for Charlie here to start with. All right, Charlie? That suits me. Then there'll be a dozen for Doc Spencer and another dozen for Enoch Samways. You don't mean Sergeant Samways, the policeman? Of course. Enoch Samways is one of my oldest friends. Enoch's a lovely lad. He likes a piece of roasted pheasant as much as the next man. I reckon he knows a thing or two about catching them as well. Are you going to share them out tonight, Dad? Not tonight, Danny, no. You must always walk home empty-handed after a poaching trip. You could never be sure Mr. Rabbits or one of his gang isn't waiting for you by the front door to see if you're carrying anything. Ah, but he's a crafty one, that Mr. Rabbits is. Are you dumping these birds at Mrs. Clipstone's place tonight? Yes. Drive straight to her place. Why Mrs. Clipstone's? Mrs. Clipstone delivers everyone's pheasants. Haven't I told you that? Mrs. Clipstone, the vicar's wife. Always choose a respectable woman to deliver your pheasants. That's correct, isn't it, Charlie? Mrs. Clipstone's a right smart lady. The vicar is very fond of roasted pheasant for his dinner. <laughs> Who isn't? You know something, Danny? We've done these birds a great kindness putting them to sleep in this nice, painless way. They'd have had a nasty time of it tomorrow if we hadn't got them first. Oh, rotten shots most of them fellows are. At least half the birds finish up winged and wounded. The taxi swung in through the gates of the vicarage. I could hardly believe it. It looked as though just about everybody in the entire district was in on this poaching lark. There were no lights in the vicarage and nobody met us. My father and I got out and dumped the pheasants in the coal shed at the rear. Then we said goodbye to Charlie Kinch and began to walk the two miles back to the filling station. I can't believe it. I simply cannot believe we pulled it off. Do you realise, Danny, that on this very night, on this Friday the 30th of September, you and I have actually bagged 120 prime pheasants from Mr Hazel's wood. Roasted pheasant, the finest and most succulent dish on earth. I don't suppose you've ever eaten roasted pheasant, have you, Danny? Never. You wait. Just you wait till you taste it. It's sheer magic. Does it have to be roasted, Dad? Of course it has to be roasted. You never boil a young bird. Why do you ask that? I was wondering how we would do the roasting. Don't you have to have an oven or something? Of course. But we don't have an oven, Dad. I know. That is why I have decided to buy one. Buy one? Yes, Danny. With such a great and glorious stock of pheasants on our hands, it is important that we have the proper equipment. Therefore, we shall go back into the village tomorrow morning and we shall buy an electric oven and we'll put it in the workshop. We've got plenty of electric plugs in the workshop. Won't it be very expensive? No expense is too great for roasted pheasant. And I'll tell you what else we've got to get. We've got to get one of those deep freezers where you can store things for months and months and they never go rotten. 
Dad, no. But don't you realise, Danny, that even after we've given birds away to all our friends, there'll soon be about 50 left for us. That is why we're going to need a deep freezer. But it'll cost the earth. I'm worth every penny of it. Just imagine, Danny, my boy. Any time we fancy a nice roasted pheasant for our supper, all we've got to do is open up the lid of the freezer and help ourselves. Kings and queens don't live any better than that. You and Mum never had an oven when you got married, did you? No, we couldn't afford things like that. Then how did you roast your pheasants? They are. That was quite a trick. We used to build a fire outside the caravan and roast them on a spit, the way the gypsies do. Does it roast them well? Um, fairly well, but an oven would do it better. Mr Wheeler has an oven in his shop with so many dials and knobs on it, it looks like the cockpit of an aeroplane. Will Mr Rabbits be waiting for us, do you think, Dad? If he is, you won't see him. They always hide and watch you from behind a hedge or a tree, and they only come out if you're carrying a sack over your shoulder or if your pocket is bulging with something suspicious. We're carrying nothing at all, so don't worry about it. At 8.30 the next morning, my father telephoned Doc Spencer, and at 9 o'clock, the doctor arrived in his car. My father went over to him, and the two of them held a whispered conversation beside the pumps. Suddenly, the tiny doctor clapped his hands together and sprang up high in the air. Oh, oh, oh you don't mean it. It's not possible. Oh, I do congratulate you, Danny, my dear boy. Oh, let me shake your hand. Oh, what a triumph. What a miracle. What a victory. You're a genius, sir. Hail to thee, dear Danny. You're the champion of the world. Here she comes. Here she comes, Doctor. Here who comes? Mrs. Clipstone. Can't you see? There, in the distance, coming towards us. What's she pushing, Dad? There's only one way of delivering pheasants safely, and that's under a baby. Isn't that right, Doctor? Under a baby? Of course. In a pram with a baby on top. Fantastic! My old dad thought that one up many years ago, and it's never been known to fail yet. Oh, it's brilliant! My father was a brilliant man. Now, can you see her, Doctor? That'll be young Christopher Clipstone sitting up in the pram. He's one and a half. A lovely child. Oh, I burst him. He weighed eight pounds, three ounces. There's more than one hundred pheasants under that little nipper. Just imagine it. You can't put a hundred pheasants in a child's perambulator. Oh, don't be ridiculous. You can if it's been specially made for the job. This one is built extra long and extra wide, and it's got an extra deep well underneath. Did you make it yourself, Dad? More or less. After I bought the raisins yesterday, I went straight to the vicarage and converted their pram into this special extra-large poacher's model. It's a beauty, really it is. You wait till you see it. Fantastic! Absolutely fantastic! Normally, an ordinary bought pram is all you'd ever need. But then no one's ever had over a hundred pheasants to deliver before now. Where does the baby set? On top, of course. All you need is a sheet to cover them, and the baby sits on the sheet. A bunch of pheasants makes a nice soft mattress for any child. Oh, I don't doubt it. He'll be having a very comfortable ride today, young Christopher. And look at Mrs. Clipstone. Right through the village, bold as brass. Oh, good for her. She seems in an awful hurry, Dad. She's sort of half running. Oh, I imagine she's just a bit anxious to unload her cargo. She does appear to be going a bit quick, doesn't she? She's going very quick. Perhaps she doesn't want to be caught in the rain. There's thunder in the air. She thinks it's going to rain. She doesn't want the baby to get wet. She could put the hood up. She's running. Look. And the baby's screaming. What's up, Dad? There's something wrong with that baby. Can you hear him, Dad? Yes, I can hear him. Oh, he's yelling his head off. He's having a fit. It's a good thing we've got a doctor handy. That's why she's running, Doctor. He's having a fit. And she wants to get here quick and put him under a cold tap. Oh, I doubt it's a fit. Whatever it is, I wish she'd stop running. It'll give the game away. Crikey, look at that. It's a pheasant. It's flown up out of the pram. Look at it. Now it's flopped down by the side of the road. Looks as if it's drunk. There's another, look, and another. Oh, great Scott. Oh, I know what's happened. It's the sleeping pills. They're wearing off. Slow down, Mrs. Clipston. You're among friends. Oh, oh what now it's happening? Oh, come along, Christopher, darling. Let me lift you out of the pram. With the weight of the child suddenly lifted away, a great cloud of pheasants rose up out of the gigantic pram and the whole sky above us was filled with huge brown birds clapping their wings. Oh, sleeping pill doesn't last forever. It always wears off by the next morning. Poor baby! I nearly packed him to pieces! Take him into the caravan, Mrs. Clipston. 
Well, All these birds are making him nervous. And Danny, push that pram into the workshop, quick. The pheasants were too dopey to fly far. They settled like a swarm of locusts all over the filling station. The place was covered with them. Across the road, a line of cars had started forming and people were opening their doors and getting out and beginning to cross over to stare at the pheasants. Watch out, Dad. Look who's here. The big, shiny, silver Rolls-Royce had braked suddenly right beside the filling station and out got a furious Mr. Victor Hazel, resplendent in fawn riding breeches and high-polished boots. The shooting party was about to begin and he was on his way to greet the guests. He started shouting at us the moment he got out of the car. Words came out of his mouth that I had never heard and hoped never to hear again. At last, my father got a word in. But they're not your pheasants, they're mine. Don't lie to me, man. I'm the only person round here who has pheasants. They are on my land. And so long as they stay on my land, they belong to me. Don't you know the rules, you bloated old blue-faced baboon? At this point, pedalling grandly towards us on his black bicycle, came the arm of the law in the shape of Sergeant Enoch Samways. What if I may ask is happening round here? I'll tell you what's happening round here. These are my pheasants and this rogue has enticed them out of my woods onto his filthy little filling station. Enticed? Enticed them, did you say? Of course he enticed them. Well, now, this is a very interesting accusation because I ain't never heard of nobody enticing a pheasant across six miles of fields and open countryside. Do you have any evidence to support this accusation? The evidence is all around you. Mr Hazel, surely you know how these pheasants came here. They knew they were going to be shot today if they stayed in your wood, so they flew in here till the shooting was over. Rubbish. It's not rubbish at all. They are extremely intelligent birds, pheasants. Isn't that so, Doctor? Oh, they have tremendous brain power. They know exactly what's going on. You are scoundrels, both of you. You are rapscallions of the worst kind. Now then, now then... Insults aren't going to get us nowhere. I suggest that we all make a big effort to drive these birds over the road onto Mr. Hazel's land. It'll be a step in the right direction. Get on with it, then. How about you, Willem? Are you agreeable to this action? I think it's a splendid idea. I'll be glad to help, and so will Danny. Come on, me lads. Let's push these lazy birds over the road. In order to fly across the road, the birds first had to fly over Mr. Hazel's Rolls-Royce, which lay right in their path with its door still open. Most of the pheasants were too dopey to manage this, so down they came again, smack on top of the great silver car. In less than a minute, the Rolls was festooned with pheasants, all scratching and scrabbling and making their disgusting runny messes over the shiny silver paint. At least a dozen flew right inside through the open door. Get those birds off my car. They're ruining the paintwork. Ah, I see what you mean. Beastly, dirty birds, pheasants are. Why don't you just hop in quick and drive away fast? They'll have to get off then, won't they? Ah, that's the way, sir. Drive on. Get going quick. There's no time to lose. Ignore them pheasants inside, Mr. Hazel, and accelerate that engine. The great rolls shot off down the road with clouds of pheasants rising up from it in all directions. Then an extraordinary thing happened. The pheasants stayed up in the air and kept on flying. Over the top of the filling station they flew, over the next field and over the crest of the hill until they disappeared from sight. Soon they were joined by the other birds around the place and suddenly there was not a pheasant left. But none had flown towards Hazel's wood. Every one of them had flown in exactly the opposite direction. Oh, great Scott! Oh, look at that! They've recovered. The sleeping pills have worn off at last. Well, Willem, them pheasants was the most astonishing sight I ever seen in my entire life. Oh, it was lovely. Didn't you enjoy it, Danny? Marvellous. Uh, pity we lost them. Very nearly broke my heart when they all started flying out of the pram. And how in heaven's name did you ever catch them in the first place? How'd you do it, Willem? It was Danny's idea. We fed them with dope raisins. Will I be jagged? Young man, I congratulate you. He'll be a great inventor one day. 
Well, thank goodness that's over at last. Mrs Clipstone, are you all right? Never in my life have I seen such a shambles as that. What a gathering we have here of rogues and varmints. How's the baby? The baby's better, thank you, William. Babies are tough. I don't care how tough they are. How would you like it if you were taken for a nice quiet walk in your pram and suddenly the mattress comes alive and starts bouncing you up and down like a stormy sea? And the next thing you know, a hundred sharp, curvy beaks poke up from underneath and peck you to pieces. Oh, well, ladies and gents, so he must be off. Uh, thanks very much for your help. Oh, he wouldn't have missed this one for all the tea in China. But it did sadden me to see all those lovely birds go slipping through our fingers. It's going to sadden the vicar a lot more than it saddens you. Ever since he got out of bed this morning, he's talked about nothing except the lovely roast pheasant he's going to have for his dinner tonight. Come with me, all of you. I've got something to show you in the workshop. There we are. Six magnificent pheasants. How's that? Two for you, Grace, to keep the vicar in a good mood. Two for Enoch, for all the good work that he did this morning. And two for William and Danny, who deserve them most of all. But what about you, Doctor? Oh, my wife has enough to do without plucking pheasants all day long. Uh, but how on earth did you get them? I had a hunch that some of the birds would eat more than one reason and so get a heavier dose of sleeping pills and never wake up. So while you were chasing the birds onto Hazel's rolls, I looked in the bottom of the pram and found these birds still there. Absolutely amazing. Marvellous. Oh, you lovely man. <laughs> it was all over now. Mrs. Clipston was taken home with Christopher and her pheasants in the doctor's car, and Sergeant Samways pedalled off with head high and back straight as though he were riding a fine thoroughbred mare instead of an old black bike. Well, Danny, that's that. It was fun, Dad. I know it was. I really loved it. So did I, Danny. Maybe we should lock the pumps and take a holiday for the rest of the day. But we always stay open on Saturdays. Maybe it's time we didn't. We could do something more interesting. I know a small wood of large trees. It's a very quiet place, and a stream runs through it. It's full of trout. Oh, could we? Could we go there, Dad? Why not? We could try tickling them the way Doc Spencer told us. And after that, there will be something else after that. And after that, ah, yes. And something else again. Because what I've been trying to tell you all along is that my father, without the slightest doubt, was the most marvellous and exciting father a boy ever had. <laughs>